execution. No, I will. I will start. I will start even if you're noisy. <laughs> I don't. I don't care. All right. Here you no, are, Joseph. That's uh, so. Well, hey, thank, thank everybody for coming. This is this is one of the the most packed meetups uh, that I've seen in a long uh, long while, and thanks so much to the organizers of the Berlin Ethereum meetup. As far as I know, this is this it was actually no, my my journey my journey into Ethereum started in Berlin. The first meetup I ever uh, ever attended was in Berlin in the old um, uh, EF's office, uh, and this is how I got involved in this ecosystem. And the, the same. People are still around. The same people are still organizing these these meetups, which is which is just awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk about Ethereum as a self-sufficient ecosystem. And well, sorry, this is going to be boring because uh, if I sell, say self-sufficient, what I mean by that is like you know taking like an economic lens and looking at the ecosystem kind of from a high-level perspective. Uh, I'll mention a lot of projects. I won't get uh, deep into those. I'm happy to then give you some context. Uh, hopefully this will make sense. If not, just like feel free to uh, ask me later on. Even if you have like anything during the during the presentation, just raise your hand. I'm happy to quickly expand, but we don't have a lot of time, so let's jump into it. Um, hmm. Okay, sorry for being a boomer. Uh, <laughs> uh, content. So uh, so. First, I will start like looking at the ecosystem, kind of from a uh, from a high level perspective. Uh, I will talk about like my breakdown of the Ethereum tech stack. Um, then I will talk about like what's a what's a safe baseline in terms of, and again, the boring part, the financing of the ecosystem, because uh, this is this is kind of the lens that I'm uh, taking. Uh, and I'm going to show you some like data about like the treasuries in the space and uh, kind of the on chain fees. Um, and again, that's kind of the my viewpoint of self-sufficiency is from this like economic perspective of like, hey, is this is this like crypto economy, the Ethereum economy, big enough so we can actually like uh, sustain itself by just the the value that it brings to the current users? Um, I probably should have also mentioned who am who am I and what what did I do before? I was part of the EF uh, for the past several years. I was working with a lot of R and D projects. Um, uh, part of the work was related to uh, to overall funding within the ecosystem, um, rather on a high level. I, I work with some of these teams like closely, uh, but some of the numbers uh, mentioned here, or most of the numbers, are just a napkin math. So don't take those don't take those like um, as you know like a universal truth. Some of those change as well. So obviously, uh, it's not always up to date. Uh, but uh, all of the numbers that I'm going to disclose are also not secret. I mean, like you can guess those just ba based on like basic math, like looking into these projects and kind of the, the number of people around those. What's that? Okay, I didn't have, I didn't know, I didn't know this was part. <laughs> I didn't know this. This was part of the of the presentation, and now now you have to think I'm a complete boomer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's actually quite fun. Uh, so uh, some numbers. Uh, so we have roughly like 2.5 thousand kind of people that we could consider core slash like shell developers, people who have like deep knowledge about the Ethereum ecosystem, people who either develop clients, tooling around the, uh, around it that understand on a very deep technical level uh, what's what's going on. Then we have roughly 200k kind of capable developers. You can see those as like the web tree cohort, like people that are coming into the ecosystem that came in the last like two years that know what's going on, they, they are technical, uh, they don't follow like client development, they're mostly on kind of the application layer. But, you know, no doubt they could switch into like being core developers. Uh, and kind of on a user level, um, DeFi is an example, obviously like DeFi is like currently the, the, the biggest use case for, for Ethereum. Uh, the estimates are that there, there's roughly like three million users. Uh, this doesn't, you know, go into detail of like how active they are. Just like three million souls that like ever touch the stuff that the 2.5 uh, k uh, people actually created. What's come on? <laughs> that's that's an evil plot. I, did, I don't think I did that in the presentation. Uh, so some some other numbers. So we have. Uh, we have roughly like five teams working on execution layer clients, uh, five plus teams working on 
uh, consensus layer clients, like in the, you know, kind of the ETH2, um, um, the pre-ETH2 uh, narrative. And we also have like more than five teams working on kind of the L2 scaling, um, which, you know, that's like, that's really kind of the, the bottom. Like the, these, these are the pillars of like what everybody is building on top of. Um, Cool, I clicked and there was no there was no animation. So who is building on Ethereum? Like obviously there's like a bunch of individuals, but again, taking the lens of like what actually like makes money on Ethereum. Uh, you see startups, you see a lot of DeFi projects, you see like services for the ecosystem, uh, you know, things like Alchemy, like infrastructure providers, like uh, those are all associated projects that make money off Ethereum in some way. Um, um, you know, it can be DeFi, it can also be like B2B solutions and so, so on. Uh, then you have DAOs, like you have a lot of, a uh, lot of DAOs these days, um, you know, building, uh, building uh, protocols, um, being somewhat like um, self-organized, like those are not real companies um, from perspective of like entities, uh, but they, they make money. There's a lot of projects in, um, in the space that, um, that are DAOs and that actually have the biggest treasuries. Um, and then you have large companies like, uh, you know, like it or not, you have like projects like AWS, Microsoft, uh, these like huge giants that, uh, actually have business associated with Ethereum as such. Uh, so from my perspective and like some of those are obviously supporting the ecosystem by sponsoring and like bringing in developers and so on. Uh, but in, um, kind of from my perspective, those could be also considered as like potential, uh, funders of the ecosystem. So just for comparison, this is data from OpenOrx. Uh, the, on the left, and you probably can't read this, this is a snapshot I took on um, July 2021. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, there is the snapshot that I took uh, 30 minutes ago. Uh, so what you're looking at here are the treasuries of, of the kind of Ethereum projects in the space. And obviously you have like Uniswap on top, with, uh, roughly like 2.5 billion dollars in your treasury. You have like Compound, uh, Ava, and some other projects. You can also see the differences um, between like last year and now. Uh, the good news is, well, obviously some projects are gone. Um, crypto crashed, um, but not so much the treasuries. Uh, so roughly there's still, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. So roughly uh, just from this, data, and this doesn't consider EF, uh, and like a lot of other kind of like other companies in this space, this is literally just DAOs, right? This is literally just the money that's sitting on chain. Uh, you have something over $6 billion sitting in those treasuries, like waiting to fund something in the ecosystem, which is good. Um, cool. Uh, so now, all right, we, so we, we have, the ecosystem has deep pockets. That's a that's a good information. Uh, now let's look at the stack and kind of like what the ecosystem could fund. Uh, so just you know, for simplicity, I kind of like went with these four little little happy boxes. So you have like the main Ethereum protocol layer. You have some research and governance uh, languages, contracts, and tooling. So uh, in the protocol layer, you have again like execution clients, consensus clients. Uh, on the research and governance, like you have. A uh, bunch of like core research around like hash functions and signing libraries, whatnot. You have a bunch of L2s. You have like the entire like zkp track, uh, stateless, and you know also the EIP process and kind of stuff connected to it. Um, then you have things like solidity and formal verification, or like fee and you know like other languages in the languages and contracts. Um, you, you also have IDEs, um, Remix, some some plugins or some like m m smaller projects in the space. Then on the tooling side, you have like obviously a lot of like tooling on like the JavaScript side, the entire like Ethereum JS, you have um, all of the stuff that the Python community creates and a lot and lot of um, other tooling. So apologies if I didn't mention a particular project. Again, this is just a, you know, super, super quick uh, run through. So, all right, we have these nice little boxes. Uh, and that was the baseline of like how much money do we need yearly to like fund things that fit into those boxes. Uh, again, this is take this as a napkin mat, but um, uh, the execution because like obviously a bunch of this data 
isn't isn't available. You know, it's private. I'm sure like there, the, the expenses, like for instance, on the um, on the protocol protocol level side, I'm sure those are much bigger. But as well, arguably, you can just take you know like uh, five clients um, and uh, divide like seven million dollars into five clients, and it should like give you. I guess like good enough like number of people that can can actually work on that for a year. So you have roughly seventeen million dollars on the protocol side. You have like roughly seventeen million dollars on the uh, on the research and governance side, where a good portion of that goes into zkps and L2. So scaling in general, um, uh, you have uh, roughly five million dollars on kind of the language and contract side. Uh, you have. Um, roughly like four, four million dollars on on the tooling side, and obviously again, like this is this is a baseline. There there is like there is much more money that could be like utilized in all of those boxes or any of these projects, um, but um, we just need an anchor. So so again, like things things that are not considered. So that's the entire like wallet ecosystem. That's the application layer, education and events. Um, operations and kind of like compliance stuff, none of that is considered within that number. So this is just like pure devs and like, you know, people uh, building stuff. Why is that happening? So, all right, uh, that's 42, surprise, surprise, 0.8 million dollars. Let's say, well, we need roughly like 50 million dollars currently uh, to sustain that kind of like basic stack around Ethereum. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, but we as well have this like six billion dollars like sitting in, in treasuries. And I'm not saying, you know, like it should just like go entirely into this. There's like a lot of stuff that can be funded, but it still kind of feels safe. So, but you know, just like having having deep pockets wouldn't really get you get you anywhere. I mean like it could get you far, but you couldn't couldn't, couldn't uh, consider that to be like anything self sufficient, self sustainable. And uh, you know, it's kind of like also, also the case of like EF, which you know is an organization that has been a, a huge resource, resource allocator in the space for a long time, uh, but it doesn't have any income. It's just like the like EF is magic. Like it's it's a, is this like huge you know like surprise for everybody where all of a sudden uh, there's this nonprofit which doesn't have to worry about uh, about like income for the organization itself. Um, because it like happened to be part of this like magic event of uh, emergence of like this new uh, new dimension of programmable money, and it happened to had that money. So, um, but that's that's definitely something that you cannot expect to happen on a daily basis. So, uh, let's look into on-chain fees and into actually this like economic demand um, on the network and like what people are actually willing to pay to use Ethereum. So again, two snapshots. Last year, July, uh, 30 minutes ago. Um, well, we are in a bear market. Um, so the numbers are slightly lower. Uh, and you can also see like bunch of projects, again, like disappearing and appearing. Uh, but it's not too bad. This is still, this is still like, again, like napkin math. Um, it's like $7 million every day. Uh, in fees for the different protocols um, or using Ethereum as such. Uh, that's, that's a huge, that's actually like decent economic demand. And like, you just need a couple of days for the entire system to work to be able to fund a $50 million uh, ticket uh, that allows it to run and that allows it to, to you know, uh, kind of like progress. Um, so things that are not considered in this number again, like, um, uh, mining rewards, uh, yield farming, uh, and all of the like DeFi kind of above um, the, the basic fees. So these are literally just the fees. Um, and like any coming to the enterprise sector, like there are no like consultancy fees, like anything that actually the, the you know, the kind of associated um, businesses that are utilizing Ethereum uh, in a different way. So again, that was just on-chain fees and obviously exchanges. That's also like a lot, lot of like, um, you know, money flow and fees that the, the, the exchanges get. And obviously exchanges are also beneficiaries of the, of the Ethereum ecosystem. Ta -da, ta -da. So, I mean, th this, this number is already outdated, but you can do the math. 
uh, you have roughly like 1.5, like $2 million, so obviously this fluctuates, um, generated or paid, rather paid in on-chain fees on Ethereum. Um, so yeah, that's my conclusion. We are, <laughs> we are fine. Uh, it's, I mean, like it, it, it's a bear market. I was surprised myself. I mean, we are in a bear market, uh, but um, um, we are fine. I mean, like, <laughs> Uh, we, we can, I mean, if, if you know, like, my, my point and reason why I started digging into the data is like, uh, we, can, we can rely on deep pockets. And I, like, what I would like to see, and that was the reason why I got involved in like multiple initiatives, what I would like to see is uh, like the ecosystem not just relying on the treasuries, but the ecosystem rather like relying on the, the social standard of like people actually giving back to the core developers and giving back to, you know, the people who actually uh, make this possible and that like help this ecosystem to progress. So I think that if we can like establish social standards that the projects that like benefit off Ethereum give just a very like tiny fraction of the fees into uh, into the development uh, of the core protocol or the associated like tool stack, um, you know, I, I think like Ethereum can actually run for like decades or like if, if not, you know, hundreds of years as the technology, obviously that's a, that's a bad stake always, like never make these, these types of takes. But in terms of the economic demand, um, the future is bright. Like I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not worried at all. Uh, and with that, it's, it's actually nine. So there was, there was a bit, let's, let's see this, the last, the last animation here. No, it wasn't there. Uh, yeah, so that was it. Thank you. Well, so actually, there's one more thing. Uh, um, there's like an obligatory shill of ETH Prague, uh, which is a hackathon slash conference happening in Prague in June, so in a couple of weeks. Um, please sign up. Uh, the, the speaker slots are already filled. There are still hacker slots that are open. There is a, there is a wait list, uh, but you know, it's like tradition that like uh, people who get free tickets kind of don't show up, so uh, we are ov overbooking slightly. Uh, so please sign up for Eat Prague and, and just like show up to Prague in, in two weeks. And I think we have questions over there. As, as I understand it, like the foundation's goal or like what I also said is kind of like to like give, basically like of course the ETH is going down in the foundation every year. Like, and and of course it might not go down in, it might not have gone down in, in dollar terms over the last five years because ETH went up. But um, I think... What do you think about like kind of like if one thinks really long term, you want to kind of have still money in 100 years in the foundation and to make it more like an endowment where, for example, like the foundation stakes all its Ethereum and only uses the staking rewards for protocol, which could like fund it in perpetuity probably. So like my, my question is more like, as I understand Vitalik and I and like the foundation, is that it actually philosophically wants to go down to zero, but I think it might be a risk to the ecosystem if it doesn't have money in 50 or 100 years to support the ecosystem. Yeah. So, so first of all, like I'm, um, I, I left the foundation, so I no longer speak on behalf. And the the fact that it's still there is just a reminiscence of the presentation. Um, um, so I can only give you like my opinion, my subjective view on this. Um, um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's more complicated because like. Um, you know, like the, the in my opinion, like the the, the neutrality kind of like also comes from the fact that like you just don't pick like projects in the ecosystem and you say like, hey, this is the way to do things. Like you don't want to, like EF at least to me was like very credible in the sense that it, it wasn't aping into stuff. It was always this like kind of like a actually quite conservative, you know, like unit. And I think there's some value in that. Like, you know, like you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to put all of your eggs into this, into one basket. Uh, so I actually think, like strategically, it's a, it's a good decision. Um, to the question of um, like, could we sustain ourselves from just like running like or getting like stake, staking rewards and like funding the ecosystem from that? Um, I, would, I mean, I would actually love to. There was a lot of lot of conversations about like kind of like taxing block rewards, you know, that's like two, three years back. I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen. Uh, I don't, and I don't want, I don't want there to be like a programmed way uh, for, for this to happen. Uh, and in my opinion, like, 
you, you know, if, if like EF did that, that would kind of get into that direction. You would just like expect this is here to stay and like, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't need these like new champions to step up like you know like folks at Gitcoin like they they do an amazing work in like showing there are alternative ways like the ecosystem can be funded. Um, so I think like the way to to actually like sustain su sustain the ecosystem isn't through like one organization such as EF like throwing like a, a huge pile of money into something that could generate returns and like funding everything from that. Uh, but I would actually say it has to come from the projects in the in the in the ecosystem. You know, even even if like some of those are programmed, like if there is a DAO that says, well, all right, we just like have a vote and we give like five percent of the fees like to this, uh, you know, um, to this contract that will distribute the money towards like uh, these five teams that build the build the clients. Like I I think that's actually that's actually a better approach because like you will you will gain like more resilience in the system if it's if it's just not. You know, if it's not expected, but it actually happens. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I would have a question, and um, I, I will put my question into an analogy. So, the the housing market, two thousand nine, two thousand seven. Um, there was also a system and, you know, the, the first um, people who couldn't pay off their debt, uh, you just need 15% of these people to uh, break down the system. And here I was wondering, is it possible that the bigger projects belong to the smaller projects? And in these, you know, like crypto winters, if the small, smaller projects breaks down, um, the bigger projects might not get enough fees, et cetera, et cetera. So is it possible? How, what's, what's your take? Um, so I'm, I'm not, not sure I understood the question correctly, but is it like if, if um, I don't know, there is, a, there is all of a sudden like something wrong with, I don't know, like Aave or something or like someone who builds on top of Aave and like this would disappear. For example, if Aave depends on, on uh, 20 other smaller projects mm -hmm. because they are running uh, on, on Aave and they don't have enough funding and breaks down, then Aave wouldn't get the fees from these projects and would go down as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a black swan, it sounds to me as a kind of like a black swan scenario right, where, right. Um, and we probably saw this like multiple times for like certain projects. Um, um, I mean, the, the good news and kind of like the, the stuff that I was trying to showcase is that um, I basically sh showed you showed you only the data, which is kind of like easy to get. You can you can like look at look into these like multi sigs that hold these treasuries, um, and um, in my opinion, there's actually like much more money in in the ecosystem than like what what you what you've seen here. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, I think it's like unlikely to, to some extent because there is a lot of lot of like deep pocketed teams, and there's like, but you know, even the stuff that you see around yourself, like take Gnosis for instance, like like this this place was started by Gnosis, right? Like, I mean, I'm sure I'm I'm kind of like missing some context, some historical context, but like Gnosis is one of the great examples of a project that like started early in the ecosystem and now they kind of like deliver more and more value across the board. Not not just, you know, in prediction markets. Uh, I'm not actually sure anyone associates like Gnosis with prediction markets these days. Um, so um, I, I think there there can there there already are multiple like champions in the ecosystem, so I'm not as worried. Obviously, like something can happen, and like people can all of a sudden like change the direction completely, and they say like, "All right, there was this was this was all like bullshit, like you know, magic intern money, like forget about it." It could happen. I'm not, I'm not, you know, like we we've seen what happened like during COVID. We see what's happening now, like um, uh, in in Ukraine and other places. Like I could imagine those scenarios before. I'm not saying it's 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 impossible. I feel like it's unlikely. All right, maybe we have time for one last question if it's a, if it's a short one. <laughs> uh, so the thing that occurred to me is if you go back to the list of all the treasuries that you had, right? Like a lot of those treasuries aren't, aren't 
that's not their money, right? So like Ave or Uniswap or whatever, right? Like that's someone else's money that's trading. But then when you went to the fees thing, it's also kind of not all their fees, right? Because they're giving a lot of the fees back to the users. So I was just kind of trying to think through it. But what is interesting that you mentioned is like if you look at Uniswap Labs, right? So these projects that manage to generate a lot of fees for a long time, they're not spending any of them and they just kind of pile up in these treasuries, right? And then, yeah, I think like Uniswap in the last year has kind of really come out and said like we're gonna just start yeah, funding stuff. And so I, I, I would encourage, and I don't know the answer, but to really kind of dig down and figure out like where is the free capital Right, and then what are what are DAOs and what are organizations doing with it, right? Because I, it seems like most of them are trying to somehow promote something that's not super like, I'm gonna get my money back right away. Um, yeah, anyway, that was my thought. Yeah. Uh, you need to down to the capture fees at zero fees. They do, I think they no, take, they, they have, no, don't they take some percent? I, I mean, as a, as a DAO, right? Like, don't they uh, take some percent of the fees? So, so that goes to the liquidity providers. I mean, like you, you're, you're right. Um, um, obviously, like there's like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's like five people or like five organizations that like make these decisions. There's like there are masses of people behind those fees, uh, ma masses of people behind those DAOs. I mean, like all of these are are DAOs, if I'm not wrong. Um, the, the the point is. Um, there definitely is this like collective interest in like making sure that this thing runs and it obviously makes a lot of money um, not, not to like few companies but to like a lot of people across the board um, but the, the other the other kind of like underlying part is um, it's like it's, it's disproportionately more than what I feel is, is kind of a safe baseline of what the ecosystem needs. So I'm sure that even if, you know, with like a whole bunch of rounding errors and like just wrong math uh, that uh, I might have used like, uh, you know, getting these numbers or like even, I'm not sure if these are correct. I didn't check like every single treasury, I just trust it. Uh, so even if there is, there is, there is a lot of place for, uh, for failure in it in here. So that's, that's kind of my point. All right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph.